a clinical practice review of catheter patency strategies with Tim Spencer. So Tim, we've had a bunch of time to talk over the last couple of weeks and uh, months, it seems. Uh, Tim's been an expert in the field of vascular access and critical care for over 30 years. He is a Suzanne Herbst Award winner back in 2019 and a subject matter expert and key opinion leader and clinical expert in the field of vascular access. Uh, we're really excited to have Tim with us today to do a presentation on a survey that went out. And thank you all who took the time uh, to complete the survey on catheter patency. And Tim's here to tell us about the results. And with that, Tim, I'm going to let you take over. How are you? Thanks, Blake. Um, well, welcome, everybody. Um, thank you to uh, Judy and Blake for inviting me to come and speak today. Um, as Blake mentioned, uh, we did a survey looking at just current practices on catheter patency issues uh, that went out via social media. So through you know, Facebook links, uh, LinkedIn and Twitter and probably other areas as well, uh, promoted by a variety of us and uh, Ava as well. And so we're just going to uh, do an overview of some of uh, the catheter patency strategies when dealing with uh, catheter related occlusion. Um, and then we're gonna dive into some of the survey results. Uh, the number of respondents that we got in total was 510. So we had a fairly good response rate uh, considering uh, the wide scope that uh, you know, the survey went out to. As always, uh, here are my disclosures um, just uh, to go through and people that I do consultancy or have educational agreements with. Um, some of the objectives are obviously for any learning educational opportunity uh, we need to provide some objectives. There's several here, providing an overview of current strategies for maintaining catheter patency. We're gonna review uh, current evidence around uh, catheter patency strategies and identify some clinical practice opportunities at improving catheter patency. One of the things that we really need to focus on is when we start a, an educational session is that, what do we know about catheter occlusion? Um, and certainly one of the things that those of us that work in vascular access uh, understand is that it's probably one of the most common non-infectious complications uh, in the use of a central venous device. Interestingly enough, as we get into the results uh, shortly from the survey, it's going to uh, also create some interesting discussion points because for us that work in specialised in vascular access infusion therapy, we're dealing with this on a regular basis. And then we have clinicians that may be not actually exposed to this or dealing with treating catheter related occlusion on a regular basis. So there's, you know, some of the results from the survey will really highlight some of these differences as well. So just like all vascular access devices, whether it's peripheral, central, whatever, they're all at risk of developing some form of occlusion. Obviously this occlusion can lead to uh, premature failure and it often can require either replacement of the device and exposing the patient to further complications. You know, these can be problematic. And so early assessment of uh, device occlusion is always warranted because we want to try and prevent that from occurring so that patients don't lose their reliable vascular access device, regardless of what it may be. Now, obviously, with a central venous catheter, there's a number of different infusion therapies, treatments that are going to be utilized uh, for the patient through this device. And so maintaining catheter patency is going to be a very, very important strategy, a simple strategy, but a very important one nonetheless um, to maintain that catheter's function. So when we have uh, intraluminal occlusion, it can be a very frustrating complication for the clinician, but also for the patient because it's disruptive to their therapies and it can potentially increase their treatment costs and even potentially length of stay, particularly if they need to stay in for longer periods of time or have device you know, replacement and, or exchange uh, to be performed as well. So when we look at catheter dysfunction, it's often defined as the inability to administer treatments due to a total occlusion or TO, sometimes people refer to it as, or persistent withdrawal occlusion as uh, also known as PWO. Central venous catheter occlusion or dysfunction can often be associated with intraluminal blood clots, but it's also other instances where drug precipitates, lipid residue from TPN, 
but also extraluminal causes such as fibroblastic sleeve, uh, catheter tip malposition, pinch off syndrome, or even venous thrombosis that can cause catheter dysfunction. Now, whether these are related or not, we're gonna take this all in as looking at device-related occlusion. There's a number of things that can trigger this and we need to be aware of that as we go through when we're looking and assessing patients for device-related occlusion and wanting to restore catheter patency. So failure to restore patency, um, particularly after addressing the cause, empirical treatment with thrombolytic agents is often frequently considered. And there's a range of clinical practice strategies and products uh, that exist to minimize occlusion um, of thrombotic related complications uh, that certainly come along uh, with vascular device use. So what are some of the strategies utilized to prevent occlusion and certainly catheter related thrombosis? Well, the optimizing the insertion technique is one of the primary strategies that clinicians can use. And that's an important component of you know, patient assessment, but also, you know, choosing the most appropriate site, not just necessarily the technique, but the site, the size of the catheter, there's a variety of different things when we look at just the insertion perspective. But certainly uh, minimizing uh, any vessel related or, and localized related trauma uh, from the insertion is going to be a very important strategy to reduce catheter related thrombosis and certainly device occlusion during the insertion phase. Optimizing the catheter to vein ratio or the catheter vessel ratio, another very important strategy at helping prevent occlusion and thrombosis, particularly thrombosis. The use of uh, innovative uh, catheter material and design has also been looked at as far as uh, strategies at reducing uh, occlusion and thrombosis, particularly in central venous access devices. And there's also been um, systemic and localized use of anticoagulants in the prevention of thrombosis, fibroblastic sleeve, and even device occlusion, as well as looking at uh, making sure that we have uh, an adequate securement device. So while these are a number of things that uh, strategies that clinicians can employ to help prevent some of these issues, there's obviously a you know, far greater you know, supply of uh, rationales on why we need to do certain things to help prevent these complications. But these are some of the fundamental uh, reasons on opportunities for clinicians to be able to help try and prevent uh, intraluminal occlusion and any thrombotic related complications. There's a number of clinical guidelines that now make recommendations to these strategies. And certainly they all uh, differ in their uh, supporting levels of evidence. So when we look at each individual category, um, we look at optimizing insertion techniques. There's a number of uh, high, level, high quality uh, evidence, particularly level one and level two, that has uh, demonstrated that ultrasound guided assessment and insertion can improve first pass and reduce overall complications. And these are just some of the examples of some papers that have been published you know, within the last few years, although there is one from the BMJ that's now a few years old, 2003, old, older literature, but it's still fundamental in its initial review. And some of the early publications that focused on ultrasound at uh, looking at central venous catheterization were some of the foundational uh, pieces to, to start really supporting the use of ultrasound to prevent uh, patient-related complica patient complications. There's, uh, you know, a recent publication in uh, JVA by uh, Alex Hawthorne uh, et al. From, uh, from Australia, looking at implications for looking at patency and performance. And certainly this uh, paper focused on the application of science into practice. Uh, so it's a very practical component. This article has also been referenced uh, quite a fair bit during this presentation as well. So there's a number of, there's a number of different and well, there's a number of publications that now uh, really support uh, ultrasound guidance for obviously insertion of CVADs and uh, a lot of high quality uh, evidence that supports this practice as well. Okay, catheter vessel ratio. Obviously, some of the uh, preliminary studies that was done by uh, Nifong McDevitt in 2011, uh, which was probably one of the groundbreaking publications uh, in chest uh, on catheter vessel ratio, looking at PICS specifically. But there's been a number of observational studies that have been done since by Rebecca Sharp and her colleagues looking at catheter vessel ratio and venous thromboembolism and suggesting that maintaining a catheter vessel ratio of less than 45% is, has a reduction on the risk of VTE. The Infusion Nurses uh, Society, their standards of practice actually brought catheter vessel ratio into the standards in 2016 
and obviously is still included uh, with uh, the 2021, which was released earlier this year, the new standards also address the same issue. And there's a section that I've just clipped out from the standards here that says, uh, measure the vessel catheter vessel ratio prior to insertion of an upper extremity vascular access device and ensure that the catheter vessel ratio is of less than 45%. And obviously uh, there's references within the uh, INS standards of practice that, that cite a lot of this evidence as well. And for those of you that haven't seen it, the catheter vessel ratio now has a definition and it is defined as the indwelling space or area consumed or occupied by an intravascular device inserted and positioned within a venous or arterial blood vessel. This is important because this all encompasses both venous and arterial or intravascular device placement. So whether we're placing a pick line, a midline, a central line, or even an arterial catheter, catheter vessel ratio is an important strategy that clinicians can employ to help uh, reduce thrombosis and uh, potential for device-related occlusion. So catheter vessel ratio still plays an important role as well. So what about catheter materials? Okay, so Eugene Slaughter published a paper just a little while ago and looked at the materials that catheters were made from to see how they influenced catheter-related occlusion. There's been significant investment, obviously, from manufacturers looking at developments uh, and evaluation of different materials and design. And this has been going on for the good part of over 30 years. So, you know, there's been a lot of investment from device manufacturers at looking at ways to help minimize uh, adhesion of uh, bioparticulate matter on the external or internal lumen of the catheter. And so, you know, there's an aim to try and reduce infection and thrombosis. Now, it's a double-edged sword in this regard, but certainly there's been uh, a lot of positive movement in catheter materials to try and reduce these complications. However, there needs to be more appropriately powered and more rigorous trials that still continue to evaluate the efficacy and the cost effectiveness of these different catheter designs and materials. So the study by Slaughter et al, uh, did, uh, the authors performed a systematic review and meta-analysis that was published in 2020, looking at catheter materials and the design on thrombosis risk and determining that there were actually no significant differences in reported catheter-related bloodstream infection, localized infection, catheter fracture, which was an interesting complication, or occlusion rates between experimental and control arms. But it didn't really break down the different types of anti-thrombogenic material compositions that were used in the catheters. I think they pretty much just grouped them down to, uh, you know, whether it was a, you know, modified surface material, you know, that was either impregnated and or whether it was coated. But it was interesting to see that their results that said that there were no significant um, differences between uh, some of the related complications that they're trying to reduce. Systemic anticoagulation. Now I'm not spending a lot of time, as you can see, going through all these like individual things because there's a lot to cover, particularly when it looks at uh, catheter related thrombosis and device related occlusion. This is more, you know, just about providing an overview of some of the strategies. What the, a lot of this focus is really gonna be on is actually looking at our survey results, which uh, went out to all our AVA members. Systemic anticoagulation. Uh, there's still a limited quality of uh, data uh, that's available for systemic anticoagulation that's looking at preventing catheter-related thrombosis. The recommendations are sort of pretty much largely extrapolated from data from studies that are in patients with cancer or uh, certainly lower limb DVT. And while there's a number of studies, there's an offset that clinicians that are studying systemic anticoagulation need to have a individual clinical assessment and they need to be able to balance the benefits and the possible adverse events of implementing such systemic uh, anticoagulation therapies. So while there has been some early preliminary studies that were done looking at systemic anticoagulation that had uh, a positive benefit there's not really high level studies that actually uh, go into this. There may be some systematic reviews. I haven't looked that deeply uh, at systemic anticoagulation as a particular literature review, uh, but it would certainly be interesting to see that. Flushing and locking. Okay, so some of the uh, strategies for preventing device related occlusion are really focused around these two attributes, the flushing and locking of a device. 
And current guidelines and practices recommend all devices to be flushed and locked or infused in order to maintain catheter function and patency. All the references, uh, which you can see with the numbers on the screen, are all in the reference list uh, also at the end of this PowerPoint, which uh, you'll be able to download and you'll be able to see the reference list as well. So the rationale for flushing and locking uh, in clinical practice is that it prevents accumulation of biological and, and exogenous material, which could otherwise contribute to occlusion and device failure. We know that when catheters are placed, we start to get uh, platelet adhesion and uh, biomaterial starting to build up on the external wall or lumen of the catheter within a few hours of the device being placed. So whether we're looking at uh, build up on the external side or even the internal side, particularly if we're using the catheter to administer blood related products, uh, there is going to be some sort of adhesion, you know, property of these uh, biomaterials uh, within the lumen of the catheter. So we need to try and prevent device failure, not just from blood products, but also from other materials, uh, medication precipitate and bits of medication that still adhere to the inside of the catheter lumen. And they can build up over time if the device isn't flushed properly obviously lead to some sort of uh, dysfunction within the catheter. A 2018 systematic review that looked at 11 trials in adults showing that locking with heparin had little effect on uh, central venous catheter patency. And this was uh, the systematic review by Lopez Breeze and published just within the last few years. Another systematic review, particularly when we look at uh, heparin locking and flushing was performed by Sharma uh, and co-authors in 2019. And they also demonstrated that heparin provided little benefit in maintaining cath catheter patency as compared to normal saline or 0.9% saline, I should say. Primary outcomes that they looked at were patency and occlusion of CVC with secondary outcomes that were uh, heparin induced thrombocytopenia or HIT, as we often call it. Uh, risk of bleeding or hemorrhage, infection uh, or thrombosis related to the CVC, allergic reaction to heparin, cost of treatment with heparin and mortality. When they did their secondary analysis, they found that there was no evidence that heparin was better than saline in terms of safety, except uh, in patients that had hits. As the quality of the review, well, as the authors stated, the quality of the evidence reviewed was fairly low and these results obviously should be utilised with care. But that goes to say with any research that's published, it's got to be looked at uh, carefully and how it can be implemented and whether it's going to make a clinical change that's going to be beneficial uh, in a clinical setting. Now, a lot of research, and I'm speaking very generally here, a lot of research uh, is about trying to improve uh, patient outcomes, device-related outcomes, and improve clinical practice. And while it's nice to have a fantastic uh, p-value, a p-value doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to have a, a great clinical significance. And we have to remember that it's nice to have a good balance between statistical significance and clinical significance. Um, now that that's out of the road, we can keep going on. So it's, I think it's finding a nice balance of what the research says and how it benefits our patients as well. So results from some, a number of clinical studies have indicated that there's variable flushing practices uh, that are being performed throughout facilities, not just here in the US, but you know, around the world. And patients and clinicians are still experiencing higher failure rates of devices. So there's no really definitive evidence on optimal frequency, volume, or mode of uh, maintenance strategies to prevent device failure, particularly when it comes to flushing and locking. Again, another study that was published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology uh, was a retrospective study of adult cancer patients that evaluated the number of alteplase installations that was used as a surrogate measure of occlusion events. So what they did was that they looked at the number of times that they administered a thrombolytic agent to treat occlusion events and use that as part of their assessment criteria. Uh, either in an active CVC or a CVC placement uh, uh, was the denominator for the patient. So this was also in a cancer hospital. The numerator was the number of ambulatory daycare centers and uh, doses given of the uh, thrombolytic agent. The pre-intervention CVC period, maintenance period was uh, between March 2016 and April 16. It's only a relatively short period of time. And the post-intervention using normal saline uh, flushes was from May 2017 to uh, September 2018. So about a year or so of each period, which is you know, generally enough to get a significant 
amount of data. And as you can see, they had 95, over 95,000 uh, catheter days with uh, almost 4,500 unique patients that were analysed in the pre-intervention and 115,000 line days and 5,500 unique patients in the post-intervention days. The baseline incident rate for occlusion was 0.91% compared to the post-intervention rate, which was 2.67. So statistical significance here, 0 0.01, uh, which is relative. Uh, an ambulatory oncology practice setting, it was, well, it was done in a high practice, high volume CBC utilization ambulatory care oncology practice. And they did have an increase in line occlusion rates uh, observed after implementing the practice of flushing CVCs from heparin to normal saline. Interesting. But, and the significant numbers as well of patients that, uh, that were used in the study. Another study by De Costa in 2019, which was a meta-analysis, identified interventions to treat occlusive events, thrombotic or non-thrombotic, once again in CVCs in cancer patients. They looked at uh, 15 different studies and looked at drugs to use that were uh, used in the restoration of uh, catheter function. And as you can see, uh, the breakdown of the different drugs, urokinase 53.3%, aldoplase 20%, Tenecteplase 13.3, Redoplase, recombinant urokinase 6.7, and staphylokinase 6.7. So the overall re result uh, for restoration was 84% across all drugs. And when they did a subgroup meta-analysis, they found that 84%, 92%, and again, 84% uh, demonstrated uh, restoration rates in urokinase, alteplase, and tenectase groups, respectively. The other ones had significantly lower outcomes. The most common interventions used to treat catheter occlusion in cancer patients, uh, obviously, were urokinase and alteplase. And there was no evidence that was found about the treatment for non-thrombotic occlusion. So there's what they were really establishing there, particularly from this statement, is that there's still a gap in the evidence and we need to be looking at further investigating uh, non-thrombotic uh, catheter-related occlusion. A study by Pan et al. in again in 2019, it was a systematic review of the literature. Um, they specifically focused on looking at clinician knowledge um, around occlusion, uh, particularly in PICs. And they found that uh, PIC occlusions were significantly associated with uh, nurses or clinicians' knowledge and skills, flushing solution method, and obviously the insertion techniques. They did not find an association between catheter type, whether it was valved or non-valved and PIC occlusion. So this sort of leads us into the AVA catheter patency survey. Now, for those of you that have joined us on the webinar today, you may have uh, completed the survey that we sent out. Um, if that was the case, thank you very much. We do value uh, everybody's input into uh, filling out these surveys because it gives us a nice snapshot of what's actually happening. We had 16 questions, uh, we had 510 individual responses. And as I mentioned earlier, at the beginning of the session, it was sent out through uh, social media outlets. And we also used our AVA uh, distribution list and also through the AVA networks as well. So some of the questions that, were, that we asked in the survey were around several clinical aspects, namely the, uh, frequent, the frequent use of thrombolytic agents, the number of doses that are required to re-establish patency, uh, questions on education and training for use, clinician competency and assessment, policy requirements, the use of needleless connectors, uh, heparinized saline, the type of declotting agents that are used, because obviously there are other ones that are out on the market as well, and some of the actions for device assessment. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go through uh, some of these survey questions and answers and we're gonna talk about those. So the first question was based on your facility policy. Do you currently check catheter tip position prior to the administration of a catheter clearance agent? 34.4% of people do check the catheter tip and 61% said no, they don't. Interestingly, that's quite a high number for no. Now, what I've gone ahead and done with, with each question is, after each slide that we review for each question, I've put up a few slides looking at the evidence around uh, why we may want, may want to make you know, clinical practice changes within our facility. Because when I go back and look at that, it sort of a bit of, was a bit surprising when I first saw, I thought more people would be actually checking their catheter tip position compared to those that said no. 
So, you know, only, you know, approximately one third of clinicians are actually checking their catheter tip. If we look at thrombosis risk and uh, tip position evidence, you know, we all understand that suboptimal catheter tip placement puts the patient at increased risk and increased harm. There's up to 16 times percent greater risk of thrombosis uh, if the catheter tip is not in the right place. There is increased risk of uh, thrombotic related infection but also highlighted loss of device function and higher occlusion rates. There's a number of studies, well, there's a couple of studies that are cited here, references 18 and 19. I, haven't, I can't access my notes, so I can't tell you what the papers are off the top of my head at the moment. But all these complications are related to catheter tip position. We also have any potential for wall injury or potential for perforation, although the risk is relatively low for perforation. But stiffer catheters like dialysis catheters, which are still CVADs, um, can still put patients at great risk of uh, vessel-related injury and also cardiac arrhythmia. So when we look at you know, the tip position and if we look at the image on the right-hand side, we look at the thrombosis risk. So if we have a catheter tip that's high in the brachiocephalic vein, we've got up to greater than 60% risk of developing thrombosis. And that will very likely lead to catheter-related occlusion as well. As we move down further towards the cavoatrial junction and we sit in the proximal SVC, we have around about a 42% risk of thrombosis. It drops significantly from the proximal SVC down to the mid SVC of about five and a half percent, and then below two and a half percent as we hit the cavoatrial junction. Relatively zero, although zero is a pretty hard end figure um, of catheter thrombosis risk in the right atrium. So 62% of tip malpositions that are in the proximal, proximal SVC opposed to 14% can uh, significantly change our thrombotic related complication rates. Tip position evidence. Well, there's a lot of focus. Uh, there has been a lot of focus recently, obviously in adults, but also in the pediatric and the neonatal population as well. And there's been a number of uh, publications, you know, that have come out, you know, in the last few years that have uh, really supported correct tip positioning uh, amongst a variety of different patient populations, particularly when we look at the uh, subspecialty or subclinical areas uh, between pediatric and neonatal and even adult populations looking at critical care, nephrology, anesthesia, neurosurgery, oncology, and also NICU. So these, these papers and guidelines support the use of technology to facilitate uh, accurate tip positioning and help reduce any potential risk to our patients. So question two, on average, what percentage of time uh, do you need to give more than one dose of a catheter clearing agent to restore patency? So 28 respondents, 28% 28 of respondents stated that they required more than one dose of a thrombolytic agent to obtain patency. Less than a third are requiring more than one dose, but that's you know, an interesting aspect to uh, the administration of a thrombolytic agent. So two thirds, are require, uh, two -thirds of, uh, of our clinicians are stating that they're usually get, restoring catheter patency with generally one dose. Now there's quite a few questions to go through and I just wanna be mindful of the time. And uh, so I'm gonna just, Go through the, just continue to go through these. So how many doses of cat, we then went on to ask how many doses of catheter clearing agent was required. And as you can see, 60% or so, just over 60% said one dose, but we still had uh, almost uh, 38, 37% uh, of respondents say that they required a second dose. Uh, very small, less than one and a half percent required three doses and no required four or greater. There has been some studies looking at the number of doses um, and certainly a study in 2017, particularly in the neonatal population, uh, each given one to four doses at restoring patency, uh, they only had 58% of administrations that were able to restore patency. The most common type of catheter uh, where alteplase was used was a PIC. 78% uh, of uh, the neonates had PICs, 8% had um, umbilical venous catheters and 6% uh, they were used in arterial catheters, 5% chest tubes, and 3% in other catheters. Now, this was, uh, this was uh, a study done in a multi-hospital NICU system. 9% uh, of the episodes were treated with a second dose between one and 17 days uh, for reocclusion, and only 50% of those success re-successive uh, infusions of uh, declotting agent were actually successful. A 2018 study, uh, also evaluated the use of one milligram uh, compared to a two, mil two milligram dose over a two month 
uh, and it was particularly uh, focusing on evaluating the use effectiveness and the cost uh, comparing the two doses uh, when they were looking at uh, restoring uh, an, an occluded catheter. The hospital were incentivized to move to a, a lower dose and do this study because they said that they, well, they stated that uh, they switched to a one milligram dose because of increasing in price. So, you know, cost can be uh, something that clinicians need to also take into account when they're looking at these clinical practices. To determine the cost of waste, they looked at expired one milligram syringes that were returned to pharmacy for collection. Uh, they administered 524 one milligram doses over the three month period and the, and the effectiveness of the first and second dose was 88 and 80% respectively. Uh, there was 34 doses that were wasted, uh, resulting in a cost of around $2,200. And they sort of estimated that with over, over a year that they could annualize about $136,000 in cost savings. Uh, their findings were that they, the author stated it was beneficial to use one milligram uh, for occluded devices and that the cost of waste was nominal compared with the cost savings for the institution. There was another study that was done. It was a double blind randomized control trial that was published in 2020 by El Masri. Uh, looking at the, once again, looking at the efficacy of one milligram versus two milligram doses. This specifically focused on hemodialysis patients, and they looked at 252 different uh, occlusion events and looking at the rate of clot resolution in the two milligram group and the one milligram group. And as you can see, the results were pretty similar. The two milligram group showing 85.7% and 84.9% in the one milligram group. Uh, Cox regression analysis revealed that there was no difference between the two groups after the initial declotting agent management. Okay, next question was, uh, does your team participate in device flushing training in your facility? Nice to see that 55.7% uh, 55 55 of clinicians that responded said yes, but there was still a number of uh, clinicians that replied no. So a fairly even, almost an even balance, 55.5 and 45, 44.5%, you know, doing uh, training within their facility to, uh, to flush. Then the next question went on and asked at the facility, at your facility, who is uh, trained uh, to perform uh, the catheter clearance procedure for flushing devices. Now this was broken down into subgroups. Primarily, as you can see, vascular access specialists were the ones that were administering catheter clearance procedures. There was a rel heavy reliance on the floor staff, uh, SWAT team, critical care, emergency department, and then others was a, was a smattering of different clinicians. So we had a mixture of RNs, uh, supervisors, nephrology, dialysis nurses, hematology, oncology staff, advanced practice providers, radiology uh, staff, infusion therapists, uh, bone marrow transplant staff, pediatrics, cardiac ICU and rapid response teams. That wasn't all of the groups. I, they were just the ones that there were the majority that people uh, responded with. But there's a number of, what that says to me is that there's a number of different people who are actually performing catheter clearance procedures on vascular access devices. Yes, the majority of them are vascular access specialists, but there's still a lot, almost 15% you know, of clinicians that are, that are not vascular access specialists. And obviously the breakdown, uh, you can see fairly clearly. We looked at also who facilitates the training. Once again, the vascular access specialists uh, were predominantly involved in the training of administering a thrombolytic agent to prevent or to treat catheter occlusion. Uh, clinical educators, uh, probably within the, didn't specify, but probably within different departments and different units were also providing uh, this education. And then there was a small percentage of uh, industry representatives and other as well. The others sort of broken down, but I didn't uh, break that out that much apart from this. What was interesting, uh, these were the other responses that I sort of put up and a lot of people, and you can see from the highlights said that they don't get any training and what training they might do, they get from the uh, instructions for use or what we call the IFU. Uh, some people are using the Lipopot policy book, which I've never used, but I don't know how up to date it is. Uh, but as you can see, there's a variety of different people that have been listed in the other responses. VP of nursing, CNS for each unit, RN preceptors, nursing staff, trained link nurses, neonatal nurse practitioners. You know, there's a huge variety. But what's interesting is that even YouTube made it to this answer. So people are turning to YouTube, which is... Uh, unvalidated uh, site for clinical training. 
and should be used very carefully. But um, the interesting aspect is that a lot of people said that they're not getting enough training or it's just not done. Interesting response from those that replied in the other. And this does sort of create a bit of a quandary to, that uh, clinicians need to consider. Now that we have a set of quality standards that, of care that relate to uh, device-related occlusion, it shows that there's also a lack in the level of responsibility in the education that's being provided. And this is below what the standards of care, and particularly when we look at guidelines and recommendations, it's below what those standards of care are setting. There's a wide variety of clinician and non-clinician trainers that are being utilised uh, to provide training uh, on this frequently occurring uh, complication. However, these clinicians may themselves have limited knowledge and competency. And this is, you know, this, this survey goes in a little bit further. And uh, hence there is reasoning why catheter patency is not uh, acknowledged or overseen by clinical specialist teams or units particularly when we look at our infusion therapy and vascular access teams that, uh, that are in our facilities today and they're not taking over more of that responsibility to do that. Now, it might be different, you know, maybe just some of the survey responders didn't have access and we just didn't get a greater mix. But, um, you know, remember, this is just a snapshot of, for those that actually replied at the time. This was you know, a week and a half ago. Question asking about... Um, Competency assessment associated with training in the uh, in your procedure in your facility. Uh, once again, fifty five point eight uh, and forty four point two percent said no. As per your policy, are you required to have documented competency in your file to administer a catheter clearing agent at your facility? Now the criteria were yes, and we are compliant. Thirty four percent yes, but the files are not up to date. Ten point eight percent no. Nearly forty percent of respondents said no that they're not documenting their competency within their educational record and 15% were unsure. But these are important because uh, obviously maintaining competency is a, has, can have a clinical effect uh, on the patient uh, and also on the device, particularly if people are not uh, doing and performing the procedure properly. So making sure that your clinicians that are administering uh, thrombolytic therapy to treat catheter occlusion must be uh, assessed on a regular basis. Does the facility use heparinized based saline as a lock or flush in your um, device patency procedures for adults? A resounding number of people said no, but there is still a small uh, number of uh, clinicians that are still using uh, heparinized saline uh, in, their, uh, in their policies to uh, lock and flush devices. And as you've seen from some of the previous literature that we've, uh, that we've sort of mentioned in this uh, presentation, that uh, there's been a lot of focus on looking at uh, heparinized saline uh, for patency compared to 0.9% uh, saline and uh, the differences between uh, the two of them. So there's, you know, this just helps highlight that there's room for practice changes as well. Uh, one of the other questions that we sort of raised was uh, what type of needleless connector do you use within your facility? You know, almost 60% of people are using uh, neutral needleless connectors, 25% uh, using or 26% using uh, positive, only a small number of using uh, negative uh, displacement uh, needleless connectors uh, and almost 13% uh, of clinicians that responded were unsure of what sort of device that they actually had. Uh, that's a very important strategy to understand what sort of uh, needleless connector that you have in your facility uh, because uh, you know equipment as well as uh, technique uh, is an important strategy to help uh, reduce device related occlusion and uh, having a good understanding of how the equipment works is a very simple and effective strategy on helping prevent these complications from occurring. It says, in your practice, do you use a catheter clearance agent for both partial and complete occlusions? Most of the respondents, you know, almost 90% of uh, clinicians that responded said, yes, they use it for both. And, you know, that's pretty much self-explanatory here as well. So when resolving a suspected chemical occlusion, so either a medication precipitate or lipid residue, uh, what catheter clearance agent are you using in your facility? Now, these catheter clearing agents are listed in the INS standards of practice, hence why they made it into the survey, because we wanted to sort of get an idea of, you know, are people using these? Uh, you know, is it being used in clinical practice? Uh, L-cysteine, uh, not much use, 4.4%, uh, 0.1% uh, molar hydrochloric acid, 7.8% uh, relatively low, 
you know, no surprises really here that, uh, you know, a commercially available thrombolytic agent is making up nearly almost 50% of the agents that are being used to treat catheter occlusion. And then there were a number of others that made up nearly 39%. In the others, these were some of the responses. It says we do not attempt to clear if there's medication precipitate. So people aren't necessarily using uh, any other agent to provide declotting. Uh, the highlighted in red is uh, where they're changing out the device. So if there's an occlusion that is non that is non plasma related or non blood related, the device is being removed or replaced. Uh, only one person said that uh, they use all of the above depending on the problem identified. So, um, you know, there are clinicians out there, uh, just few and far between that have maybe access to all of those de different declotting agents. Uh, another, the other question, when you've assessed a multi-lumen uh, occlusion and you find one lumen occluded, what action do you take? Do we use a declotting agent on the occluded lumen only? And 70% of respondents said yes about 25% of respondents said that they were using declotting agent on all lumens. Uh, about 4.7% of others uh, stated other reasons. But the majority of people are only really treating the single occluded lumen, uh, which is interesting. What their responses were in the others in that 4%, although it's really relatively low, uh, there were some interesting responses. Some people clamp and mark do not use. So they're leaving a lumen occluded with the patient still using the device. Now, this can increase the risk of infection and uh, there's enough documentation around leaving uh, clotted lines uh, left in situ and some of the complications that can arise from that. Uh, some people are lucky, they don't see it in their setting at all. They don't, some people have said they don't use the lumen, they just use the other lumens. Some people say I follow an INS, but not everyone does all lumens. So there was a wide variety of different responses uh, to some of these questions. Certainly uh, when it comes around to uh, declotting, some people broke it down more into like catheter devices, like one person said, uh, depends whether it's a Hickman's or a Peak or both lumens, single, double lumen, triples, quads. Uh, they're normally removed early and replaced with a Peak or a PIV. So even then we're so, that's sort of giving us the inference that uh, some of these patients are having their central lines removed and they're having either a replacement with a Peak or they're going straight to a peripheral catheter, um, which is interesting. Uh, question 15 uh, looked at rating. Uh, when you have, when doing assessment for an occluded device, uh, what actions do you take? So what we wanted to do was uh, number the choices in order. And as you can see, uh, just from the bar graph, but also I numbered them down the side because uh, it was, you know, it came up with, we had to get a total score that uh, aspirating and flushing with saline was the uh, first step that most clinicians went to. Uh, and the second step being assessing the catheter or the tubing for any kinks or any acute angles where that might've been caught in the bed rails or there's been a twist in the, in the tubing um, and looking for some form of mechanical obstruction. The third step that most clinicians went to was replacing the needleless connector. Quite often, you know, as we know, they can get filled with uh, a little bit of blood from you know, regular aspirating if it hasn't been, if the flushing technique hasn't cleared out some of the blood or there might be just a buildup of uh, other materials around that are making the, the needle-free device not work as well. So it's one of the easy replacements and, uh, sim and certainly simple. Uh, performing a dressing change was the fourth strategy uh, that clinicians employed if they found that uh, they had a device occlusion. Verifying the tip position came in second last and very last was uh, using the declotting agent. So it highlights going through the number of steps uh, from one to six uh, on where clinicians focused on the most, which is pretty normal and follows the general consensus around the steps that we would follow uh, when we're assessing a device occlusion and the steps that we would take to actually remedy that. So of, as always, I always like to pull up uh, the uh, INS standards of practice, the recommendations, and certainly uh, section 49, which focuses on central vascular access device occlusion. Uh, they do have, this is very much broken down into the major um, practice categories. They go from A through I, and as you can see, uh, assessing for signs and symptoms of CVAT occlusion. But I've also included the level of evidence that supports uh, a lot of the, uh, the sections within uh, this recommendation. Assess vascular access device patency by aspirating for a blood return and flushing each lumen with 0.9% uh, preservative free saline uh, prior to administering any solution. Again, level five evidence. 
assess the infusion, injections, flushing procedures, and other events uh, with the CVAD that led to the occlusion uh, to determine possible cause, level five evidence. Obviously, this is looking at what medications have been administered prior to uh, any signs and symptoms of catheter-related occlusion, whether it be a precipitate-based occlusion or, or anything else. Um, and this is where pharmacy is going to be really important um, and be very helpful to, to turn to to ask them, you know, what sort of drug interactions there may be between certain drugs um, that may have been certainly administered. And certainly the medication chart is going to give a very good uh, like historical picture of what medications have been administered, certainly if it's been within the last 24 hours, 48 hours or so, and signs that, uh, you know, catheter occlusion may be developing, you know, pumps alarming, things like that, poor flow. Uh, rule out external mechanical causes. We sort of mentioned that as well. Assess for internal uh, mechanical causes. Uh, classic sign is a uh, pinch-off syndrome. Um, obviously, if a central venous catheter has been uh, placed very close to the junction of the first rib and the clavicle, uh, we can see signs of pinch-off syndrome. Uh, secondary malposition, uh, catheter-associated DVT, uh, implanted access port failure, and certainly kinks related to tissue and surrounding vasculature, you know, the head and the neck uh, movement causing kinking of the catheter, you know, whether it was placed in the internal and external jugular vein. Uh, once again, level five evidence, but also simple strategies that clinicians can employ to actually look for problems that may be causing device-related occlusion. Uh, reviewing the patient's uh, medication record, we've already mentioned that. Treat all catheter lumens with partial withdrawal or complete occlusion. Do not leave occluded lumen untreated because another lumen is functional. Prolonged fibre inflammation is a risk factor for catheter-associated bloodstream infection. I did mention this before, um, purely because some of the in the other respondent section, people were saying that uh, clinicians were saying that they were leaving devices in and just using, you know, the remaining lumens. It does put the patient at risk, even though the there's level five uh, support for that. We want to minimise harm and risk to the patient, and so either catheter removal or catheter exchange is going to be uh, the most, you know, suitable response to dealing with a lumen that's completely occluded and patency can't be restored. We also need to monitor patients who have received a thrombolytic agent for signs of infection and thrombosis, and also monitor our outcomes related to the treatment and device failure and any other measures that we may employ uh, during the treatment of catheter occlusion. Uh, professional recommendations. We're getting towards the end of the slide. I just want to make sure that I'm getting close to time, which I think we are. Uh, recommended clinical practice standards uh, have, have uh, position statements and recommendations around catheter occlusion. That is obviously INS which we all know uh, very well. Oncology Nurse Society also has um, recommendations. AVA does, the American Association of Critical Care Nurses, and also HICPAC from CDC have recommendations on catheter occlusion as well. I'm sure there are other professional bodies that may have addressed catheter-related occlusion uh, within their own uh, you know, guidelines and recommendations. Um, these are just some of the ones that are probably the more common ones that we see more frequently in published literature. So the last question was looking at, have you ever used uh, catheter uh, clearance agents on midline devices? Um, no surprises that everyone, you know, 74% says no, never have done. Uh, a few have some has said rarely and some said sometimes. The reason why we ask this is because obviously there was a study that was published a little while ago uh, by Mickey Hawes uh, looking at uh, assessing and restoring patency in midline catheters, because uh, just like any vascular device, we want to prevent, you know, unnecessary removal, particularly. And uh, while we do understand that this is, uh, you know, an off-label use of uh, some particular products, uh, there is further investigation that and research that is going to be probably focusing um, on the use of a thrombolytic uh, agent on treating occlusion in other devices. So a lot of this is more about watch this space uh, because I'm sure that there's going to be uh, future research that is going to address uh, some of these related issues. Now that gets to the end of the survey questions. Um, what I'd really like to say is thank you to everybody that participated in, in filling out the survey because it gives us a small snapshot and a little bit of insight into you know, what clinicians today are actually doing uh, performing and what they're thinking about um, as far as clinical practice um, 
and changes, looking at policy, you know, what needs to be included, you know, who's doing the training, who's maintaining competency, how often, we didn't really address how often is competency being done, but, you know, that goes with anything else that is going to be generally a, um, a facility-based uh, reporting mechanism. But it's certainly something that's very important and we need to all consider that when we're looking at doing training and, and maintaining our own clinical competencies as well. So uh, any, I think we can open up to question time. Yeah, I'm gonna take over the remote, Tim. Yeah, go for it. I turned my video, I, I turned my video off Blake so it wouldn't distract me before. <laughs> no, this is great. And we've got a, a ton of questions. We saw a bunch of people raising their hands during the presentation. So mm -hmm. um, we would love to have people come on camera or on mic. If you have uh, your hand raised, so let me just see what I got here. I can't well, real see quick, you, Blake, see I just want to let, make sure everybody knows that this is the end of the CE portion of the program today. And if um, the name of a product comes up, it's absolutely fine because the <laughs> CE part's done. Yes. Please address the age-old issue of hepatization of both PIVs and CVADs to maintain patency for extended use. Okay, please address the issue. Well, there's a big issue there. Uh, the big issue is that there's been a lot of like high level reviews saying that heparinized saline doesn't make any difference. Uh, there's a number of published uh, systematic reviews and meta-analysis, uh, including Cochrane reviews that look at evaluating heparinized saline versus saline. And saline was deemed to be safer and just as effective across the patient studies. I think the big thing is, is that while there's, you know, a number of published studies and evidence around when we look at uh, locking with heparin and uh, heparinized saline versus saline, um, it needs to be assessed individually. Like there's strong evidence that supports the use of saline over heparinized saline. Because remember, in a patient that's at risk of developing heparin induced thrombocytopenia or HITS, any dose of heparin can uh, trigger a response, whether it's one unit, 50 units, or 100 units, or 10,000 units. Obviously, the greater the dose of heparin, the more increased risk of, that they, the patient has. And if you look at the literature, when I last looked at the literature re regarding heparinized saline and saline uh, in more detail, there was more hits in patients that were having... The literature stated that there was more patients that were developing hits when heparin was being used as an infusion as, as opposed to a small volume, low dose uh, flush. So there's, you know, there's a, there is evidence around there that says that, you know, HITS is, is prevalent with any heparinized based solution, but there was a higher risk uh, in uh, patients that had, were being infused with greater concentrations of heparin. Uh, I always sort of believe, you know, the minimalist approach is sometimes the best. Um, we gave away, and I'm just speaking from my previous experience at my hospital's thousand bed trauma facility in Sydney. Um, we did away with heparinized saline, except in ports. So every other CVAD uh, was locked with uh, saline, except for ports. And that was mainly in the outpatient setting anyway. Um, I would say, as always, look at the recent look at the recent published literature and uh, make your own decisions. It's nice that we can all get up here and say, "Do this, do that," um, but that's not what it's about. It's about making the best decisions based on the evidence for for you as an individual clinician, but also for your facility and your team. Uh, Tim, here's a question: uh, How exactly do you check catheter tip position at the bedside? That's a really good question. Well, there's a number of ways that you could do it. Uh, depends on what you've got available to you, but a lot of, uh, a lot of bedside uh, clinician would probably utilize a chest X-ray okay. because that is still and has been the gold standard for many, many years. But there's a growing number of clinicians that are using um, ultrasound, um, particularly uh, to verify uh, using a micro bubble technique or agitated saline. I'm not going to go into that uh, too deeply at the moment because it's really looking at just an overview of the techniques. 
So uh, transthoracic uh, echocardiography can also look at catheter tips. So you can, uh, if you uh, can be trained up to uh, look at the heart, certainly the, you know, the SVC, the CAJ and the right atrium with the transthoracic probe, uh, you could actually use ultrasound to scan the chest and uh, look for catheter tip position. Um, the other alternative is uh, using ECG. And uh, while there are a number of uh, different ways that you can apply ECG to a catheter, uh, the most simple and effective way is to use a, co a column of saline method uh, because it doesn't require the use of a guide wire to be passed down the catheter or anything like that. And you can actually look at the amplitude of the P wave uh, using a transduction uh, or you know the, the electrical impulse uh, being transduced through the uh, column of saline, or conducted, I should say, not transduced, uh, being conducted through the column of saline. Uh, you know, they're probably the primary ways that uh, bedside clinicians could utilize uh, different techniques uh, to be able to perform uh, ongoing assessment for catheter tip position. I'd say the most frequent and you know what everybody would probably turn to first uh, would be you know possibly a portable chest X-ray. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, do you find that ultrasound tip verification is more like an emerging technique? Uh, I like that the air bubbles. Um, the yeah. Micro, yeah, like agitated saline, because they yeah. did have bubble studies and like echocardiography. Absolutely, exactly. And look, you know, for a long time, I was a little bit skeptical about the bubble study and micro air emboli and stuff like that, uh, particularly if you had, you know, uh, septal wall defects and things like that, then all of a sudden air bubbles can get to the wrong side and get onto the arterial side. Um, you know, I've had discussion at length with a number of uh, critical care physicians, some good, some bad, some indifferent. Uh, about the bubble study, I was a little bit, I wouldn't say I was against it, but I was hesitant about it because, you know, our circulatory system is air free. Why would we be injecting air into it if it's supposed to be air free? And that was my problem. But, you know, I sort of changed my mind after having a few discussion with some, you know, some really good emergency and critical care physicians who said that very small amounts of air actually just get reabsorbed very, relatively quickly. And there's no risk of like air embolism or, uh, you know, arterial, you know, embolism, um, unless that there's like some form of septal wall defect. Um, but the, just to go back to what you said, Blake, as well, is that yes, ultrasound is emerging as a more, um, I think it's more frequently performed by our physician counterparts than it is from say vascular access specialists. But it doesn't mean that it won't be growing. You know, we all use ultrasound regularly every day for patient assessment, for device insertion. We can look at it for ongoing scanning of thrombosis, for fibroblastic sleeve, you know, all those things um, that have been certainly discussed at a number of, you know, scientific meetings, not just AVA, but, uh, you know, a variety of different scientific meetings uh, that focus on these sorts of issues. And I think that there's going to be a growing a growing requirement around the use of uh, ultrasound to perform some of these uh, indwelling assessments. So while a catheter is still in and we can actually get a better view. The other thing is too, is that ultrasound is harmless to the patient and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really, if you want to break it down into simple terms, it doesn't really cost anything. Like a chest X-ray costs, you know, X amount of dollars, but because you've already got an ultrasound machine, it's already, you know, it's already been included in your capital purchase, right? So you're going to go around with the machine and start scanning people. I think the biggest thing is, is that having the right probe is going to be an important strategy because the linear probe that we quite often use for vascular access, whether it be peripheral or central venous access, uh, is not going to be able to penetrate past the ribs to be able to see. So understanding the benefits of using TTE or transthoracic echocardiography or, and using a probe that's similar is going to be very beneficial. So until you know bedside clinicians that you know that work on vascular access teams are taught how to use that, you know ultrasound is, uh, for checking CVC or CVAD tips is still going to predominantly remain in the physician world until you know until we have further training and you know qualification around you know vascular access specialists to use transthoracic procedures. Absolutely.
Okay, B is asking from San Diego, can you TPA a totally occluded midline? Um, she believes cath flow recommends not to TPA midlines um, because that would be off label. And we've, we've been talking about that. Do you continue with off label method? And I think um, as an AVA webinar, we can't tell you to continue on an off label method, mm. but um, talk to Mickey Haas. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the, you know, we all, we all live in a real world. We all understand. Right. We all know that uh, off-label procedures occur every day. Uh, but off-label procedures are deemed by the clinician at the time whether it's going to be safe for the patient. And so there's a number of criteria uh, that have to be satisfied before a clinician will, you know, will step into necessarily an off-label procedure. I don't want to focus on it too much because it's something that we don't generally try to you know, promote and it's it's not about promotion, but it's understanding that, you know, we do know that these that off-label procedures occur and clinicians have to take the responsibility themselves and also ultimately their facilities if they're going to be performing off-label procedures. What is important though is that if people are doing off-label procedures, that they're actually collecting quality evidence around it and publishing it because it's only through publication in quality journals, scientific meetings, et cetera, et cetera that will help change an off-label use to an on-label use. And, I, you know, while I always, always encourage, you know, scientific rigor and collecting quality data and stuff like that, um, that goes both in the off-label and the on-label world. Here's a, here's a good question. Um, <clears throat> and more of a technique question. Can you describe how you administer cath flow in a completely occluded catheter. Okay. Do they want it my way or do they want it in a, in, in a general way? Because <laughs> well, well, the way that I used, the way that I used to do it, um, particularly uh, we didn't, we didn't use a lot of declotting agents um, back home. Uh, but when we did require to use it, um, I used a three-way stopcock system. And what I would do is I would have connect the three-way stopcock directly to the lumen of, that was occluded um, and put a 20 mil syringe or 30 mil syringe uh, on the right angle piece of the stopcock and then the declotting agent that had already been reconstituted uh, on the other side. And what I would do is I would create negative pressure and turn the stopcock off to the larger syringe that was creating that I was pulling back on the plunger to create negative pressure and then open it to the declotting agent. And what that would do in theory is that it would make the walls of the catheter create a vacuum. And then once that was released to the open aspect of the syringe of the declotting agent, it would draw the solution in up against where the clot was. That's how I used to do it. Um, I'm sure that there are other ways that you know that clinicians have used and utilized i found that when i did it that way it worked for me but like i said in all honesty we didn't have a lot of tpa usage um, in central lines uh, in the early days when i was doing dialysis catheters uh, in the late 90s uh, early 2000s we used a lot of urokinase on tunnel devices because they were implanted uh, as opposed to, you know, acute percutaneous devices. And uh, so we used to, we used a lot of urokinase back in that day. That was before like TPA was used and stuff like that. But uh, the technique for drawing the uh, declotting agent into the catheter, I use the same technique all the way. And actually, um, I probably should give a little kudos to a clinician that's been a friend of mine for 25 years. Uh, Ann Evans, who I met at INS in 1997, and she actually shared with me her policy. She's from Evansville in Indiana, and she shared with me her hospital policies at the time on how to declot a, a, a catheter, and I actually used those to create um, our own policy at our facility many, many, many years ago. So, you know, the technique is, it's, it's not new. It's been around for a long time, and that was a, a similar technique, as opposed to having an occlusion and trying to inject right up against it, which can risk rupturing the catheter and doesn't really work properly. So, and un unless someone's got a better way or have, has found a better way to administer and, and, and instill uh, a solution against a total occlusion, uh, I'm all ears 
you know, I, I never use the stopcock because I just, I don't care for them so, so much, but a similar fashion though, creating the negative pressure. How did you do that? Pull back on the plunger. It would, eventually you would get it even with the same plunger. So, okay. So you would reconstitute, you'd reconstitute it in a large syringe and then just keep pulling back on it and doing it that way. Yeah. yeah. I would. Okay. Yeah. Oh, look, you know, horses for courses, right? Everybody. And that's why I said, everybody does different things. I like the stopcock method because it allowed me to be able to change the syringe from the negative pressure syringe. So if I needed a bigger one to create more pressure, I'd get a 50 mil lure lock and pull right back on it. And that would really suck down the lumen hard. And so when you opened it to the declotting agent, it'd just be like straight up against the edge of the clot. Great point. So, Great point. With the sound effect too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's the musician the, in me. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, here's a question. Uh, would you out to place a newly inserted pick uh, when one of the lumens do not yield blood back on aspiration or would you replace the pick? Well, firstly, I would verify my tip position. I would go through the process like we said in the questions. You know, we had six different items on why. And if it's a newly placed pick, um, like, I mean, is it newly placed like within a couple of hours or, you know, 24 hours, you know, it could be sitting up against a vessel wall. So one of the first things that I would, what, one of the first things that I would probably check would be tip position. Um, maybe give it a gentle flush first, because if it is sitting up against a, a vessel wall, it just might need pushing away from the wall a little bit with a, with a bit of gentle flushing. Um, but I would still follow the same procedure I would for a catheter that was in for five minutes, whether it was five days or five months. And I still, you know, I, I, I firmly believe that following a, you know, a standardized process on device assessment is gonna be an important aspect. But yes, absolutely. If, if, it's be, if it's a newly inserted central line, why would we treat it any differently to a central line that has been in for a longer period of time? Right. Because we're really trying to standardize a process that you know all clinicians go through to, to make sure that we're following a set pattern. Absolutely. But yeah, I, 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 would, I would follow the same pathways. I, I wouldn't pull it out and exchange it until I, unless I absolutely had to. My first thought was it's in the azagus. I mean, if they just yes. put it in, and it, they're not getting a blood return, it's not position in likelihood. So I'm with you, check position. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Do a PA and a lateral. And if it's got that little tick mark, then yep. pull it back. <laughs> okay. Um, How about providing your thoughts, Tim, on the movement of the catheter post-placement? Um, this uh, mark is heard that it can move any many centimeters due to patient movement, the arm, breathing, um, assuming proper securement was in place. So mm -hmm. just the regular biological functions that um, some people don't think about with this. Well, you know, if we think about where a catheter is generally secured, it's outside of the body. So as long as that there's no, if there's no pistoning at the insertion site and it's fixed, any movement, you know, whether if it's a peak, you know, and we're looking at the arm or if it's a CVC, like if I've got a central line in my neck, you know, and I'm doing this all the time, then the tip's moving up and down. And certainly, you know, there's, you know, there's always going to be, you know, movement of the tip position. I think what's important to remember when it comes to tip position and certainly movement of the catheter is making sure that the tip is in the right place to start with. Um, you know, a little bit of entry of the catheter, if the catheter moved down from the cavoatrial junction and sort of just entered the right atrium, generally is not a cause for concern. Because when the patient is resting, you know, and the tip is in the resting in the right place, whether it's the distal SVC or at the cavoatrial junction, it's not really going to move that much. Unless the patient's doing whirly gigs and, you know, gymnastics, um, then, you know, I would certainly, you know, we all know, um, you know, cautioning patients that have got pick lines from lifting their elbows above their shoulders and stuff like that. So, you know, while we understand that there's movement you know, that there's just normal movement of the catheter. We also need to be sensible and use common sense approach to minimize the amount of movement that a patient will be doing. I remember, you know, seeing patients, you know, in our outpatient, you know, seeing outpatients and saying, listen, you know, you can't be lifting weights, you know, above your head, like boxes off shelves and stuff like that. If you're going back to work with your device, we know that catheter tips move. Um, it's, you know, it's a, it's a law of physics because it's fixed here. 
and it's free floating in here. I think the most important thing is making sure that the initial catheter tip position is in the correct place. Because if we go back to the slide that I brought up, which had the picture of the heart and we looked at thrombosis risk, the more proximal the tip is, the more chance we've got of having a malposition uh, as well, and also any chemical uh, or mechanical related uh, complications that may be, uh, you know, that may persist from having a catheter tip that's too high. The only thing it, I think you could be talking about, Tim, is when you're raising the arm or bringing it down to the side, there's a one to three centimeter um, rise and fall into the mm -hmm. camera. Yeah. Taking a deep breath, that changes it. So on, if they're going purely by chest x-ray, mm -hmm. which is kind of the old standard, you can get something where it looks like your, your pick grew. <laughs> Actually. If, Absolutely. If, Absolutely. So, that's an odd phenomenon. You know your yeah. pick can grow if it's it, it's still secured at, at one or zero, mm -hmm. and then you your next X-ray and it looks four three centimeters deeper. Yeah. So it can happen, but um, to your point, yeah, you don't want to start uh, playing a new game of volleyball out there with a brand new line. No, absolutely. But uh, you know we have to under we have to understand that this is you know this happens every day with patients right. that have have devices that are placed there is always going to be some movement what we're trying to do is actually minimize that amount of movement and you know hence when we do you know chest x-rays or whatever you know when we're positioning the patient uh ecg is really good for this particularly with pics as well as because you can you can make abductions of the arm uh you know intraprocedurally and monitor the p wave amplitude at the same time and optimize uh, your catheter tip position. So when there is movement of the patient's arm, you can see how much the tip, uh, you know, becomes proximal to say the SA node. And so where the, your P wave amplitude may be. So, you know, there's a number of strategies that can be employed intraprocedurally as well to help optimize tip position. So that if there are going to be, you know, abductions or adductions of the arm, particularly for patients with peaks, we can sort of try and compensate for that a little bit as well. Tim, this was fabulous. Thank you so much. And oh, my pleasure. It's great. Blake, as always, you did a great job. But guys, thanks so much. Make sure you fill out your survey. We love to hear your, your comments on these. And we'll see you next time. And then we will have a podcast coming out about this where Tim and I get to chit chat about this a little bit more. So guys, thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Be safe out there.